Okay, so yesterday we had intended to close out the series on games that I uh, played personally in tournament play that I learned from. And uh seemed like it, it was going over pretty well with the lessons and a few points. <laughs> Remains to be seen whether or not the students in the room will use it, but we're going to continue this. And this game, it's an opening that probably – you guys haven't seen in the room. Um, and I, I bounced around with openings for a long time in, in my development just to see uh, see what it was like to play some. Or I, I was looking at a game, and I thought it was cool, so I'm like, yeah, let's do it. Um, and this game I was playing against, uh, he was a multiple-time um, Georgia State Scholastic champion. He and his brother, like back-to-back, -back, they won it like every year, every year, every year. They're really, really strong. And both of them were like 1,800 and like five, six years younger than me. So I'm 1,600 playing against the younger brother who's 1,800. Let's go ahead and get started. I had black in the game. And we'll get to a key moment. And it's a, it's a psychological mistake that I made. And it's interesting. So this is a time when I was playing a knight c6 Sicilian. And today, I, I wouldn't touch a knight c6 Sicilian with a 10-foot pole because you have to face the Rosalima. And honestly, I've done a deep analysis of this opening, and I'm pretty good with my opening analysis. I feel like at, at very worst, white has an advantage in every variation. Like, at worst. Like, I don't even think black can attain equality. It's just so good. But my opponent decided to go, go into it with me. And this particular Sicilian breaks a lot of convention because I tell you guys don't ever give them the d5 square well this Sicilian called the Sveshnikov Sicilian gives them everything positionally which means if you're giving your opponent huge positional trumps in the position you need to get compensation elsewhere where's that elsewhere where you're getting compensation where is it? Yeah. You've got to attack to make up for the positional nuances. Because, I mean, as soon as you play e5 here, these squares become immediately weak. So we got to fight for that. My opponent plays knight d, b5. And here, if I allow knight d6, i got to give up the bishop pair in an open position. So makes sense why I play d6. He plays bishop g5. Now, there's a couple different lines here. Bishop g5 is the main line. But a trick line here that you need to know if you're going to play the Shveshnikov is after knight d5. There's only one move. Otherwise, knight c7. You must take. And when he takes, knight e7, then c4. And if black gets cute, which seems like an obvious move, a6, after queen a4, Bishop d7, knight d6 mate. That's happened to a lot of people, believe it or not. So you got to know this line. And, <laughs> like, it was played against me three times in tournament play when I was playing the Shveshnikov, just because it's so aesthetically pleasing that, like, everybody plays for this trick. So after c4, you're supposed to move this knight. So if he plays queen a4, you can play bishop d7 because the pawn's covered through the bishop and the knight here. And normally later you're going to play g6, bishop g7, castle, and black's just fine. That's, it's a reasonable position. Now, this isn't what happened in the game. This is just a key line that you need to know. Like when, when you go through like, like the, those books like Traps and Zaps by Bruce Pandolfini, that's one of those that's always in the, the opening section on traps. He plays bishop g5. I play a6, and now you got to deal with this, so you break the pin. And there's two different ways to play after bishop e7. You take, or you don't take, <laughs> pretty much, and you take. You can take again, but he decided to go with c3, and if somebody's going to give you the bishop pair, you use it. Okay, pretty straightforward game so far, all forcing. Um, there is a line right here after knight d5, which you need to know. You can play queen a5 check here. 
And the only move that is is good is bishop d2. <laughs> so then you go back to d8. And many games have actually been drawn here by grandmasters, which it, it comes up like a prearranged draw. And there's a documentary on YouTube with uh, Kasparov where he played against like the top, I want to say, five to seven U.S. junior players. He played a simul against all these guys who are like 23 to 2400. And one of the guys playing white repeated moves and made a draw with Kasparov, and Kasparov like chastised him. And the, he was like, you have a chance to play a game against the world champion. Why are you like forcing a draw like a sissy? And I was like, if the man's saying that, you got to listen. But it's important to know these little tricks and traps in here. I personally never played queen a5 check against anybody, but I mean, just saying. So bishop e7, and we get this position. He plays knight c2, and it's pretty clear what white's doing. He's clamping down positionally on the light squares, doing what he's supposed to be doing. All good things. Now I'm castling. And based off this structure, what move do you think black needs to play pretty quickly here? Because it goes along with this aggressive theme we're talking about, right? What do you think, Ben? Okay. Uh -huh. Queen e8 runs in a knight c7. Uh huh. F5. Yeah. At some point, you need to play f5 because it's all about aggression. You got all these pawn weaknesses. You're playing to attack as quickly as possible. He plays bishop d3, and this this was him combining two lines. You're either playing for the knight to go to e3, or you play bishop d3 immediately, and you wait to see if that knight goes somewhere else. Sometimes instead of c3, you play c4. There's a few different lines. I play knight e7. And I'm like, okay, bishop pair, good. His knight's still awesome, but all right, I can play bishop e6. And right here, if it was black's move, after bishop takes knight, I would say that black is winning the game. Like, it's, it's that big of an advantage. So say if he, like, just castles here, takes, takes, f5, and black has a huge edge because this is no longer a weakness. It's a strength that he can't get to. And when you have bishop of opposite color, it favors the aggressor. And black is clearly the aggressor with the pawn structure where I can do lifts, get my queen and rook over there, and just attack on the king side pretty cleanly. My opponent, instead of castles, plays queen f3. And I'm like, uh, yeah. So... <laughs> Here is where it gets interesting. I touch my F pawn. And when I was placing it on F5, I was like, crap, I'm dropping a pawn. So this, this is that psychological moment where you've touched a piece. You have to move it. What would you do if you touched the F pawn? You should play F6. Because it's not losing a pawn. It looks ridiculous, but it, it's funny because an international master was like walking by and he saw me touch the F pawn and he saw me do it and I just let it go on F5. And he's and after the game, he came by and was like, dude, why didn't you just play F6? And it didn't even occur to me at the time. But psychological mistakes. I play F5, he gets a free pawn. But the thing is, well, I mean, it's not really a pin. G6, bishop, e6, check. When the king moves, queen moves. So not much of a pin. But it's bishop of opposite color. And if I can make it to an end game, bishops of opposite color are notoriously difficult to win. Which we'll see. I've got a few different games that I have lined up to show you guys. I'll show you guys a game that I played against uh, international master Ron Burnett where I was either two or three pawns up, and it was bishop of opposite color, and I couldn't win. So, Bishop of Opposite Color is so hard to win if you're playing against somebody who's good. King H8, so mates threats, and I'm like, no. Okay. 
go away. Attacking stuff. He's like, oh, threat and mate and trade queens. I'm like, uh, that helps me a lot. You're not nearly attacking me as hard. So a4. And of course, rook c5. If pawn takes, I'm just getting on. But after rook c5, I got some reasonable play. Bishop b4. B4. Getting pawns on the same color or opposite color. And here, white should put all of his focus in getting this guy to go home. He wants to go home. Bishop there, bishop there, and push a bunch. That's all you got to do. But then he gives me time to be annoying. Now the pawn can't go there. And he's got to watch the F2 pawn. Counterplay. See, th that main feature of bishop of opposite color is... Two versus one. If they're coordinated, you got two pieces, I can attack a single spot. He's got to defend with two, meaning the king always has to be tied down. So I'm able to force this ending. And right here is another mistake. I play g6, and this is this is ridiculous. Why am I putting my pawns on the, the color squares where he can attack it? Because now I'm going to have to waste time getting it right and now it's it's just dead drawn my opponent of course to his credit tries to win but then he realizes that I got my pawn back my king will defend the base my bishop will defend that one no progress can be made by either side and we agreed to a draw so there were a couple of different things takeaways from that. One, the opening, because the Shveshnikov is a kind of interesting opening. Um, two, the touch piece thing. It was a psychological mistake that I made, but, you know, always consider if you know you're blundering when you touch a piece, can I move the piece anywhere else? As long as you haven't let it go, you still have the ability, or you haven't made contact with another piece, you still have the ability to move that piece to another location. So, I mean, I made this mistake at 1600, which is higher than pretty much everybody in the room other than me so I mean it's something that you should definitely take into account when uh, you make these types of tournament rule errors